This video is supported by Brilliant.org. We think we understand a lot of things today, and in general we do. It's a wonderful time to be alive. We're discovering exoplanets, seeing back to the earliest days of the universe, curing diseases, making videos from your home that people see from all around the world. And yet, there's still so many things, basic things, that we still just don't fully understand. Like sleep. You know, we think that we need a certain amount of sleep every night, but it turns out there's some people out there that have a genetic mutation that allows them to get by just fine with a lot less sleep than the rest of us. Why doesn't sleep deprivation affect these people? And what in this one little gene mutation makes it possible for them to be like that? And how can I get this gene mutation? We don't know. And while we're on that subject, dreaming. Why do we dream? You know, there are studies that show that if you don't get REM sleep and the dreams that come along with that, it can lead to depression, anxiety, weight gain, hallucinations. What we don't know is why. Why do we laugh? Why do we yawn? How exactly does consciousness work? We don't fully know any of these things. One more thing we might add to that list is uh, Jupiter. Pretty much everything about it. It's just a total mystery. Jupiter's great red spot was likely first observed back in 1665 by astronomer Gian Domenico Cassini. Yeah, that Cassini. And the reason why I say it was likely first observed is because it wasn't observed again until 1713. So we think it's the same storm, but there's no way to know for sure. And the longer we study Jupiter, the harder it is to tell for sure, because as it turns out, and any Google search for images on Jupiter can tell you, it's got a lot of storms. We got big storms, small storms, white, brown, red storms, circular storms, oval storms. Jupiter is basically just a big collection of storms with a bunch of moons around it. But the great red spot, the biggest and most famous of all these storms, is shrinking. And we don't really know why. But perhaps we're asking the wrong question. Maybe the real question here is, how did this thing form in the first place? And then why did it last so long? Jupiter is not like Earth. They're both round, they both orbit the sun, and the similarities pretty much in there. Earth, as you might have heard, has mountain ranges and valleys and streams and water features and a topography that interacts with its atmosphere, whereas Jupiter's surface is just flat, like flat, <laughs> like flatter than Nebraska, which by the way, proportionally is actually flatter than a pancake. Somebody actually did the math on this. But those surface features on Earth interact with the atmosphere, slowing it down, stirring it up, and causing storms. But Jupiter is decidedly flatter because Jupiter is all gas. Even the surface of Jupiter is gas, which I'll get to more of that in a minute. But with no surface features to slow down the atmosphere, there's nothing to keep that wind from raging as fast as it possibly can. Meaning the winds whip around Jupiter at a blistering hundreds of miles an hour, and they stay that way for centuries. But once you take a deeper look into Jupiter, things get interesting. All that swirling hydrogen and helium in the upper atmosphere of Jupiter starts to change phases as you go deeper down in the pressure builds, meaning they start to liquefy. Keep going down another 20,000 kilometers or so and you'll see another phase change take place because it gets so pressurized and so smushed that the electrons actually come out of the atoms and flow across the surface. Do you want to get metallic hydrogen? Because that's how you get metallic hydrogen. And this, we believe, is the surface of Jupiter a completely flat, featureless expanse of superconductive hydrogen metal. Which is pretty metal. It's also the perfect conditions to whip out insane amounts of energy, like 10 million amps. Which might explain why lightning on Jupiter is 100 times brighter than it is here on Earth. But back to those never-ending hurricane-level winds on Jupiter, they travel in these colorful stripes across the planet called zones and bands. The belts are the orange and red stripes. They travel in a westward direction, and they're a little bit lower in the atmosphere. The zones are the white stripes. They travel in an eastward direction, and they sit a little bit higher in the atmosphere. Now, what causes these colors is still kind of a mystery, but we think it may be chemical reactions in the upper atmosphere uh, interacting with the sun's UV rays. The UV rays break down molecules that we call chromophores because they change colors under different types of radiation. Now scientists are pretty sure that it's heat from inside of the planet that spurs all of this activity on the surface, but there's a couple of different competing models with this called the deep model and the shallow model. The shallow model was first introduced in the 1960s and it's basically based on our own weather patterns of evaporation, condensation, creating tumbling convection currents that create storms and patterns in the atmosphere. Now all this churning creates extremely large storms like we see on Jupiter, but it doesn't account for the longevity of these storms. That's kind of the flaw in this model. The deeper model came out in 1976 and it uses the fluid dynamics Taylor-Proudman theorem. 
It states that any fluid that's held together with just pressure, like the hydrogen, the liquid hydrogen at the center of Jupiter, would uh, start to circulate in different cylindrical zones. Think of it like this. You have a sphere. Now segment that sphere into cylinders parallel to the spinning axis, each having their own independent rotation. Any place where these cylinders intersect creates a jet stream which goes on to make the zones and belts that we see from the outside. Now it does need to be stated that these are just theories. Jupiter's thick atmosphere makes it virtually impossible to see what's going on underneath. But what isn't hard to figure out is how these, you know, different movements of jet streams collide and create vortexes that eventually become storms. And one thing that we have noticed is that the smaller storms are more white and the larger storms are more red. In fact, back in the 1930s, they first observed three oval uh, white storms that later combined into one storm and they called it Oval BA. Now what's interesting is that when these three white oval storms combined, they turned red. And scientists think it's because it stirred up some of those chromophores, put it up into the upper atmosphere, and it, you know, reacted with the UV light and turned red. And this might possibly prove the whole chromophore theory. And this is how we think the Great Red Spot was made. Friction created a vortex or a series of vortices between belt SEB and zone S trop Z that eventually combined. These two areas are very strong jet streams that create a lot of storms, that many of which have been devoured by the Great Red Spot over the years, possibly feeding the storm and keeping it going. And another newer theory about its longevity has to do with vertical flows inside of the storm. A 3D model made by Pedram Hazanzadeh, a geophysical fluid dynamicist at Harvard University, suggests that vertical flows take away cold gases and introduce warm gases that continually feed energy into the storm. The model also suggests radial flows pull winds from high-speed jet streams around the Great Spot into the storm's center, which may also be helping to keep it going. But still, there's no denying it, the Great Red Spot is shrinking, and we don't really fully understand why. Now, some people think that it might not be shrinking so much as just being redistributed. Because observations have shown that the storm is getting progressively higher in the atmosphere, uh, meaning it might just be going deeper instead of wider. Like imagine that this is the great red spot. Let's say we're looking at it horizontally, like through the atmosphere. If you squeeze the circumference like this, it expands up and down. So the volume stays the same. It just goes more vertical than horizontal. And this new height is now carrying those chromophores into the upper atmosphere, causing it to go redder over time. And it's also becoming more round over time. So it might be that the, the winds around it are picking up speed and causing it to sort of tighten the belt a little bit. But seriously, something I can't stress enough is that all of this is just theories. Um, our knowledge of Jupiter is so thin. It is just a giant mystery to us. And don't even get me started on the poles. I mean, what is happening here? You know, unlike Mars, where you can just land on the surface and maybe ride a little rover around and take some pictures and stuff, Jupiter's surface is barely even a surface. It's just a barrier beyond which, the, you know, the pressure attached to it causes the laws of physics to start crying uncle. So it's probably impossible to ever build a probe that can withstand the pressures enough to get down below the clouds and see what's actually happening down there underneath all that frothiness. The Galileo mission dropped a probe into the Jupiter's atmosphere and it collected data about the composition and the temperature and that kind of thing, but uh, it only lasted 57 minutes before Jupiter just crushed it like a tin can. Jupiter is a monster. And there's also the intense radiation around Jupiter, which means that long-term probes like Galileo and Juno have to actually do it through a series of flybys so that they can limit their exposure to that radiation. Juno's mission began in 2011 and has been producing some of the most mind-blowing images we've ever seen of Jupiter, including pictures from the closest flyby of the Great Red Spot in history. Its mission is expected to end in 2021, but there are more missions on the way. India is launching a yet unnamed probe to Jupiter sometime in the 2020s, and the Chinese National Space Administration has one planned for 2029. Although most of our attention when it comes to Jupiter has to do with its moons, especially Europa, which is the best opportunity in the entire solar system that we can think of with its underground ocean to possibly have life. We'll obviously keep an eye on the Great Red Spot over the next few years to see what happens. Maybe it'll fizzle out and disappear and we'll get to see a once in a millennium event. Or maybe this is all part of its natural cycle and it might expand out and keep growing and outlive all of us. So to sum up this entire video, fluid dynamics, it's hard. Jupiter is basically a star that just didn't have enough mass to become a star. Like all my childhood dreams, it just didn't work out that way. <laughs> Maybe that's why it's so angry and frothy, like me. But if you'd like to learn more about why it didn't become a star or what would have happened if it had become a star, a great place to learn about all that stuff is the astronomy course on brilliant.org. The astronomy course has an entire section on the life cycle of stars, how they form, how they generate energy, how they evolve, and how they die. Plus many other sections on exoplanets, gravity, cosmology, and more. 
And the astronomy course is just one of more than 60 different courses on Brilliant, covering everything from logical thinking to advanced calculus, neural nets, you name it. And it works by walking you through a set of problems and helping you to figure it out on your own so you can remember it better and apply it to other areas of your life. They teach you how to think like a scientist, basically, with interactive puzzles that you can even download on your phone and take it with you. You can sign up for free at brilliant.org slash answerswithjoe and get access to their weekly brain teasers and puzzles. And because they love lifelong learners like you, for the first 200 people who sign up for the premium subscription that gives you access to all their uh, courses, you can get 20% off your subscription for life. I mention Brilliant a lot on this channel, and that's because they are awesome. So definitely go check it out. Brilliant.org slash answerswithjoe, links in the description. Big thanks to Brilliant for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon that are making all this possible, making it so that this can be free uh, for the rest of you. So a little applause for them down in the comments below. Uh, there's some new people to join. I gotta murder their names real quick. We got Andrew McNiven, Vietor, Dario, Lester Scuggs, I'm sorry, just Suggs, <laughs> Per Asborn Evanson, Mark Ruby, Elizabeth Sutton, Bartaz Heller, Jeff Groves, Jeff Stagg, uh, Laura Rennie, Becca Green, Shane Appleton, John Andrews, Puppy Space, Ken Vale, Carrie Smythe, Edward A., Jim Lodovici, and Matheson Bailey. Thank you guys so much. Uh, if you would like to join them, get early access to videos and uh, ex exclusive live streams, that kind of thing, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please do like and share this video if you liked it, and if this is your first time here, Google thinks you'll like this video, and Google's never wrong. Uh, you can also check out any of the videos on the side over here, and if you like what I do and you want to see more, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday and every Thursday. And that's it for now. Thanks again for watching. You guys go out now, have an eye-opening rest of the week, and I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys. Take care.